Thank you for coming this morning. I'm loving those reindeer antlers. I got to get some. I love them. I love them. I'm so jealous right now. If you have your Bible or if you have your packet, we're coming from page 34, the book of John, if you will rise to your feet in honor of God's word. I'm going to preach. We're going to, we already phrased, I'm going to preach and then we're going to reach the community to the world and anyone present. And we'll praise God and give him the glory and the thanks for what he has done on this day. What he has done on this day. We're coming from the book of John, the very first chapter, starting at the ninth verse, the 14th verse. But I'm just going to lift up the 14th verse this morning, and I'll just preach from the ninth to the 14th. And it reads as follows The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. I'll read that one more time. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and beheld, we beheld his glory. The glory of as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Please be seated and pray with me now. Father God, we can only do this thing called life with you. Without you, Lord, we, we can't do it. And if we haven't learned over the past year how much we need you, how much we have to have you in our lives, Lord, remind us today, because it was your birth in Bethlehem, it was your, it was your coming down as the greatest gift ever to be a prize for us, to be a child that is born for us, to be the Emmanuel, God with us. Father God, we just thank you for your son, Jesus. Without him, this day would be just normal any other day. But today, because of your birth, Lord, because of your presence, because of you thinking and not robbery to be with us, to bless us with your presence. Father God, we thank you for the greatest gift, Christmas, your son, Jesus, being born. Father God, I pray now that someone receives the message of salvation today, that someone wants to know you for their Savior, that someone wants to be part of your kingdom, Lord, today, and know you for forgiveness of sins and salvation of their soul. I thank you in advance, Lord. Let the congregation hear me, but see and hear you, Lord. Stand up in me where I'm weak. Build me up where I'm torn down. Father God, we thank you for this awesome day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Giving honor to God and the saints in Christ seated here before me. I'm going to lift that verse up one more time. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word made flesh and dwelt among us. i like to speak from the thought this morning. The living word. The living word. Turn and smile at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh my neighbor, I have the perfect gift for you. It's Jesus. You hey, that's the best of most, that's the best gift you can give a friend to give a family member is salvation. And salvation can be found only in the name of Jesus. Everyone has finished and run to the mall and all the outlet stores. Every place to go shopping is done. It's closed. Publix is closed. General store, General Dollar's closed. Dollar General's closed. Everybody's closed. And I hope everyone found that perfect gift for that special someone. They've got their loved ones list and we've checked them off once and we checked them off twice. All the hustle and bustle of the holiday season is over and upon us. We are here Christmas morning. People have spent thousands, if not billions of dollars on gifts. Everything in Amazon has been shipped out. And if it's caught up in that storm that's been tying up on the runways and byways and highways, it will arrive probably on Monday or maybe by next Sunday. 
But 2022 has been maybe a difficult year for some people. And I pray that the perfect gift for everyone here today is Jesus. I have it. It's Jesus. He's the kind of friend that you don't have to buy anything for him. But the wise men felt it not robbery to give gold, frankincense, and myrrh and bring it to him. Jesus has supplied, promised to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And not our wants, but our needs. You see, these days people have forgot the true reason for the season. Say his sweet name with me. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. He is the reason for the season. Sean, I know you didn't know that, but I'm going to tell you right now. Jesus is the reason for the season. Christmas these days have come, and for some folks, it has gone already. But flashback, if you would, if you would please, when I was a little kid. You see, I had a problem with ants when I was a young kid. I had ant problems. My ants would come vi visit me all the time before Christmas and ask me what I would want. They would want to give me the right presents. They asked me these questions and I would say I want a G.I. Joe with a Kung Fu grip. I want a matchbox car. I want an electric football. Y'all know those electric football with the little players. They go and they butt mouse on go back and forth and they go in circles and never go anywhere. I wanted that. And then my aunts or my aunts would bring me handkerchiefs, underwear, t-shirts, and socks. Why go through the whole motion of asking me what I wanted if you're going to bring me underwear, t-shirts, and socks? Yes, I sound like an ingrate, but many of us have sometimes the same attitude with God. You see, Mr. No, while we were yet sinners, God gave us the greatest gift in the world, his son Jesus. While he were dying in the trespasses of our sins, he gave us his son. Now, here's the thing. The ungodly, the evil of this world, God came to save them too. Us as well. You see, we love the verse John 3.16. But I think the most neglected verse in the Bible is John 3, 17. You see, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Someone should shout off that. You see, Miss Pat, you see, God saw our needs and not our wants and gave us the most perfect gift today, his only begotten son. You see, sometimes we act like ingrates. You see, sometimes we act like we get caught up in this world. We're blinded by the devil who deceives us, confuses us, distracts us, causes us to get all caught up and lost, run them up, and even led astray. You see, Miss Margie, like the Titanic, we sometimes wreck ourselves in the ice of the things we want, our desires, and losing focus on the Lord. You see, Sister Stewart, the Lord promises to meet our every need. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. But Miss Tammy, what we have here today is in the text, we're going to see God saw what we needed the most. He looked past our foolish wants and desires only to fulfill our need. Brother Levi, we're going to see a need for our Savior. So let's draw closer with verses 9 through 10. That true light that we saw was light of every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. I'd like to give you three for the Trinity, for the glory of God. My first point, we see the living word came into the world to save it, but wasn't recognized by it, and was rejected by it. The living word came into the world. Jesus came into the world to save it, but wasn't recognized by it and was rejected by his own people. Let's dissect this text quickly this morning. Look at verse 9. John is describing Jesus, the light of the world, the true light, meaning there's no evil, no deception or lies found in Jesus. 
And Gabe, he's holy, he's pure, he's true. John is referring to the light that gives revelation to the truth. Inside each and every person, there is the truth. But here's the problem, we want to deny it sometimes. You see, Jesus said, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. But the devil, the ruler of this world, has blinded our eyes and hardened our hearts so that we turn from God. You see, Brother Steve, what the devil is afraid of is that we should see with our eyes what we should understand with our hearts and turn to God instead. You see, the heart of man is naturally inclined to doing evil and darkness and wanting his own desires and not doing what is godly, but doing what is ungodly. We struggle against principalities of this world, darkness, and evil things. But God has placed the true light inside each and every one of us, and we must come to accept it. Jesus is the creator of all things. Everything is visible and invisible. Thrones, principalities, and dominions. We have free will deep inside of us to accept Jesus or reject Jesus. But here's the problem. When we're confronted with the truth of salvation, the true light of the world, we run to darkness instead of Jesus, the true light. We rather reject Jesus and accept him. And here's why. The Greek, John uses in the Greek word today, the word cosmos, when he used the word world. The word cosmos. Now, here's the thing. He uses it 78 times in the book of John. You see, the word cosmos, when it's used, it refers to the people and everything negative or evil in the world. And the systems that are evil and operate in the world for evil and not for good. When Jesus, the true light, came into the world, the light of every man that comes in the world, by our sin nature, we reject and repel him. Paul said it this way when he was telling the Romans the truth about one thing of salvation. He said in Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, the, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the, his internal power, the Godhead. So those that see it are without excuse. Let me give a quick example of that. Meaning, when the wind blows, you know there's wind. You don't see it, but you know it's there. We know there is a God because he created everything. You look upon the stars. You look upon the earth. When you look at each other, you're able to see because only by the grace of God. You see, here's the problem. We profess to be wise, but became fools and took the glory of God, the incorruptible thing, and made it into images like ourselves, birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. And God has given us up at times when we want to be foolish to our sinful ways. We exchange the truth of God for the lie and worship the things of this world, our TVs, our cars, our jobs, our families, our spouses, our husbands. Whatever it may be, we put those things before God. But here's the thing. How do we know this to be true? Look at the text, verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Have mercy. That's rejection. Jesus came into the world to save it, but it knew him not. Jesus made the world, but it knew him not. You see, Jim, that's the equivalent of a child being raised by his parents when he's old enough to walk and talk, getting up one day telling his parents to get out the house. It's my house now. You kick them out, push their clothes to the curb, and make your parents homeless. That's the rejection that we give God when we don't recognize him for all that he has done in our our lives. But the devil is a liar. You see, J Jesus came into the world, to this cosmos, to save us from sin. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. The same for the Jew first and also for the Greek. But look at the text again, verse 11. Jesus came not came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. Imagine tonight if you came home at Christmas and your family didn't recognize you. You had been gone for so long, you just went to church service and came back home. But it tells us that Jesus came in Matthew 1, that he came down 40 and 2 generations. It tells us that he is the descendant of Abraham. He is the descendant of David. But when he came to earth, he preached God's love for three years. The 
32 years he was born, and 33 years, he died. at the 33rd year, he died. You see, the Pharisees who were preaching at the time did not believe in him, did not want to recognize his miracles. His own people rejected him. They rejected his own message of salvation offered by him. They rejected the true light. But we serve a God of second chances. We serve a God who is the light of the world. We serve a God and we need to recognize him and not reject him. Look at the text, verse 12. But as many received him, he gave them the power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We see my second point. We see the living word came to do the will of his father, giving power to those who believe in his name and were born of the will of God. The living word, Jesus, came to do the will of his father. And gave power to those who believe in his name. And were born of the will of God. Brothers and sisters, there are two wills. The will of God and the will of man. These two wills are in constant conflict with one another. The problems you have in your life can be explained because you are trying to solve them on your own. Leaning and depending on your own wisdom and knowledge and not trusting in God's. We are told in Proverbs 3 and 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord before your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. But see, Rachel, have you ever noticed that every time you try to do things according to your will and your way, it becomes a disaster? But when you are doing things according to God's will and God's way, even the disasters become miracles and are blessed and not cursed by God. Do you know why? Because Romans 8 to 8 says, All things work together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose. You see, Sasha, the God I serve, the God your mother serves, the God your grandfather and grandmother, the God that we serve will not lie. Proof of that is Abraham. When he needed a child to be born, he didn't want to trust God and decided to do it in his own will. And that led to a whole lot of baby mama drama because it was outside of God's will. His name was Ishmael. But when he did it according to God's will, the child's name was Isaac and everything after that lined up in the work. It wasn't until Abraham trusted God that his life lined up with God's will. You see, here's the problem. Verse 12. But as many men as received them, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed in his name. You see, people that receive and believe on Jesus' name get blessings. That's power to be sons of God. But it requires you to believe in Jesus. We are children of God through faith in his son. Galatians 3.26 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. There are two ways to be born. The natural way and the spiritual way. In the text, verse 13 is referring to both. One is full of sin and pride, the other is holy and pure. Verse 13 says, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The first part, let me explain that. Born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man. Human birth is shaped in sin and iniquity. Producing children, society allows males to brag about their masculinity. I made that baby boy. I made that baby girl. That's something i done. That's man's will and pride. But look at the last part of verse 13. The last three words. But of God. When we move our butts out of the way and work in God's perfect will, then we are operating in God's holiness. We are operating in his love. We are operating in what we experience called spiritual birth. 
Jesus tried to relate this thought to Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a Pharisee, when he came at Jesus at night, asking the question and seeking his guidance. Jesus responded, truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What Jesus was referring to was believing in him by faith is the only way to get to heaven. That requires faith in me, Jesus. That's what he was trying to say. So your belief in Jesus gives you birth or being born spiritually into Jesus. That is an act or will of God. Come on, give God some glory right there. Being in the will of God means you recognize your need for forgiveness of your sins. The world, the cosmos, will reject you because of that. The world will hate you because you love God. The world will hate you because you love Jesus. Not the world. See, the world wants you to love the things. That's the devil. Wants you to love the things. You must choose to separate yourself from the world and move closer to Jesus. Once you've done that, you can present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. Brothers and sisters, we have to decide to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove that what is good and acceptable. What is that? The perfect will of God. And when you've done that, and when you decide to do that, when you decide to trust and lean on Jesus and lean on God, then trust me, you're no longer in your will, but it's God's will being done. Before I start the review, let me just say a few few scriptures real quick. You see, you're saying you trust Jesus for salvation. Acts 4.12. There is no other name in salvation for man than under heaven by which man can be saved but Jesus. You have to submit to his will. Miss Pat, Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him for the dead, you will be saved. But here's the thing I want everyone to understand. Crystal, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, that whosoever, just take that out and put your name right there in that scripture and make it personal, make it ownership, make it yours. But here's the best part I love about scripture. When you start to trust Jesus, Hebrews 7.25 says, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he is always lives to make intercessions for men. That just drives me up the wall with joy because here's why. He makes intercessions. He gets to the middle of it. He stands between us, between death and hell by being on that cross. He gave his life. That's the best gift ever. We get eternal life. Say it sweet name with me. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. The Savior of the world was born today. Come on and give God some glory right now. But let us review. Go home and open up the rest of the presents. We see my first point. The living word came into the world to save it, but it wasn't recognized by the world and was rejected by his own people. My second point. The living word came to do the will of his father, giving power to those who believe. Y'all do believe y'all have power inside you. It's called the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit lives in you. In his name, and we're born of the will of God. But my third and final point, we see the living word became glory in the flesh and was the fullness of God's grace on earth. The living word became glory in the flesh and was the fullness of God's grace on earth. Look at the text, verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Come on and shout hallelujah right there, y'all. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Look at the word, the sacrifice, the unselfish nature of Jesus, giving up heaven to wrap himself up in a flesh suit of human flesh. 
giving up the beauty of heaven to walk among the ugliness of earth, giving up the riches of glory of heaven to come down here with poverty and disgrace. But the wonderful thing about Jesus coming down here is he brought heaven with him. Somebody should shout him out there. Look what it says. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. But look at what it says. We beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten Son of God. Here's the thing. When he came down, he brought his glory with him. He didn't leave it up there. He brought it with him. We beheld his glory out of heaven. And he did what? Look what it says. He dwelt among us. We saw the living God. Oh, how it would have been love to have been back then. To see the visible image of the invisible God who was on earth. But let's break this text down just a little bit further. He became flesh, the Word, the living Word. The Word was with God, always existed. There had never been a time when Jesus has not existed, has always been, but left heaven. He was 100% God and became 100% man. He was a God-man. He was a perfect lamb or sacrifice, having never sinned to be offered up by God for the sins of this whole world. Made like his brethren so that he could save them. Hebrews 2 and 17 says, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful, high priest in pertaining to all things of God to make propitiation for the sins of the world. But the best part is, it allowed him to do the following. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, is able to aid those who are tempted. We have a Savior that knows what it's like to hurt. Knows what it's like to cry. Knows what it's like to be hungry. Knows what it's like to be abandoned, left alone, forgotten, and forsaken. He knows what it's like to be like you. Yeah. There haven't been a day that goes by that you ever thought that you were alone and that no one knows your pain, no one knows your sorrow, no one knows your tragedy or your story. My Jesus knows. Your Jesus knows. He knows everything you've gone through. And he feels it. Why? Because he's been just like us. The word became flesh. And now look what it did. It dwelt among us. Now let me give you what that means. Tabernacle or tent. It's referring to the Old Testament saints of Israel who traveled and worshiped until King Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. They would take the tent down, put it back up, take it back down. But God doesn't need a tabernacle anymore because he dwells in the temple right here inside of you. Fulfilling the Old Testament system of worship, now he dwells with us. Look at the text again. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of God. Glory draws on how God would manifest himself on as a cloud of um, a cloud in the day and fire at night. Just in case y'all may have forgot Sunday school, the, the cloud would dwell over the temple and then the fire would lead them in the daytime. Well, now that fire shines brightly inside you. Now that cloud is manifested in you. Now that glory is in you. Now God's glory is walking on water. He's talking to women at will. He's raising the dead. He healed the blind, the crippled, and even the demon-possessed person. Jesus, the incarnation of God, the Word became flesh. A living, breathing, working miracle. But let me be clear about what he did. He died, was buried, and resurrected, and ascended to heaven. And sitting at the right hand of the Father. Going on behalf of us, intercession daily. Get ready because I'm going to give you the last part of the reason why we should start praising. Look at the last five words of verse 14. Full of grace and truth. Somebody help me out and learn how to count. There, that's five words. Now here's why you got to praise God for his fullness. God never does anything halfway. Remember last week we talked about um, more and more? When it comes to the Bible, the Lord of hosts will open for you windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing there'll be no room for receiving it. You see, that's that more and more. Give it down, press, shake, good measure, shaking it again, running over, putting it in your bosom. Meaning, everything you need will be poured out to you. Jesus is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask and could even think. But here's your chance to shout, it gets even better. Just when you think life is empty, just when you think it's over, You've got Jesus, the living word made flesh. Jesus lives and dwells in your heart. We say it all the time, greater is he that is in me than is he that is in this world. You 
you got God's glory inside of you. So let your light so shine that your Father in heaven may be glorified. Brothers and sisters, we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, but it's a gift of God. Grace has saved us. Grace has called us for God's own purpose. We have grace when we're dead and the trespasses of our sins. Grace that comes from age to age to age to be that exceeding richness. And we know one thing for sure. Amazing grace, how sweet it sounds, that saved a wretch like you and me in the fullness of time. God came down in the fullness of time. You know, Randy, people this holiday season get sad, stressed out, become depressed. You know, dead people get drunk. They may take some kind of drugs to mask the pain they're feeling inside. They even contemplate that horrible thing called suicide. But the devil is a liar. Margie, if only people would stop for a second and think about all their problems and chase them away and think about the living word. Jesus, people would stop and think for just five seconds. Look at the world around them. Look to the word. 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 Read the word. Study the word. Know the word. The word is Jesus. He tells you he loves you before the creation of time. How do I know this? Because Jesus told me in his word. He's always keeping his word. He's always telling the truth because he is the living, breathing truth. This whole sermon can be summed up in one name. Emmanuel. Look at the text, verse 14 again. And when Jesus, the word, was made flesh and dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word or name Emmanuel means God with us. Verse 14 literally spells out Emmanuel, the living word. You have to choose life, brothers and sisters. You have to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Don't let a day go by where you don't know Jesus for salvation of your sins.